So a fun fact about me that you might not know is when I started college, I was originally a chemistry major. Now it's been a while since I wanted to be a chemistry major and I only made it through a couple of semesters of my freshman year of college, so bear with me on this metaphor. When creating and observing a chemical reaction in the simplest sense, you take multiple chemicals and combine them, causing a reaction resulting in one or more different chemicals. And all chemical reactions involve an exchange of energy, either releasing energy or absorbing it from its surroundings. This would be exothermic and endothermic. I do remember that much. And it's only when all of the elements are in place that you could reasonably expect to see that chemical reaction happen. No one would expect this vinegar to have a reaction by itself, right? However, baking soda combines with vinegar and turns into something else. Vinegar and baking soda become sodium acetate, carbon dioxide, and water. And a lot of fizz. We're not done yet. I did put a towel down, so I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> Somebody tell me if that gets ugly. <laughs> Forgiveness is the fizz. It's the result that lets you know that you have arrived at a transfer of energy, that all the metaphorical elements of the experiment of healing <laughs> have come together. In and of itself, Forgiveness, or fizz, that's not where the energy is exchanged, it's what comes after the exchange of energy. It's not what makes the magic happen. Just like so much, the magic happens in the process. The grand experiment itself is the healing and wholeness that only come through time and work and intention. Just like in a chemistry experiment, the reaction itself is not the chemicals that are combined or the chemicals that are produced, but the exchange of energy created when one thing becomes another. What exists, hurt, pain, resentment, trauma, grief, can become something else through an exchange of energy. So what does this look like? Well, I still can't tell you exactly what that looks like. Because unlike chemical experiments, the results of healing experiments seldom turn out the same. But there are a few things healing experiments have in common. One, to get free, you have to get really specific about what you are forgiving. And you can only forgive harm that is done to you. I came across a concept from Judaism that a family cannot forgive a murderer for killing a loved one because they were not the ones who were killed. They can only forgive the grief and pain and anguish that they themselves have experienced. And this seems liberating to me, but also scary because I can only forgive the harm that has been caused to me. But this requires us to actually see the damage that has been done and to confront what specifically we have been harmed by and what we might need in order to heal. Most of us avoid looking closely at these kinds of wounds at all costs. They are painful. They're nasty and scary, just like a physical wound might be. Some of us don't even want to watch when a nurse draws blood. And these are wounds that are hard to look at as well. It feels much easier to channel that emotion into anger or rage. Thing in common number two. You should do that, that anger and rage thing. You should do that too. 
Anger can often be the fire that cauterizes a wound, that allows it to scar over and heal. Too much anger, too much fire, and you might get burned. But without that heat, you will never be able to create that scar. And it is more difficult to confront what has happened to you and recognize what you need to heal. So get angry, feel the rage, feel the pain. Now once you know what has happened to you, you can name what you need, perhaps what you are owed. Maybe you feel owed an apology, an explanation. Last week we talked about this idea of reconciling with harm as something that is distinct from forgiveness. And when you are reconciling with harm, it might lead you to seek understanding for why you were harmed. Sometimes this is possible. Sometimes this understanding continues to elude us. But here's, the, here's, here's a tricky thing about forgiveness. It is only right to forgive when not forgiving costs too much. Pain and anger can set a fire under you. They can give you strength to accomplish things that you otherwise might not have. But these things can also crowd you out of your own life, looming larger than the rest of all of your existence and preventing your wholeness. So forgiveness only works when not forgiving comes at too high a cost. And only you know where that tipping point is for yourself. If you are still hemorrhaging in pain, forgiveness can feel more like a weapon than a tool. Forgiveness is a tool only when it is wielded at the cost of stay, where, when the cost of staying where you are is too great. And this is a good thing. The same, this same process of recognizing what the harm is, feeling the emotions that underlie your reaction to that harm, and naming what you need, this process also applies to yourself. All of us have disappointed ourselves, fallen short of our expectations. Perhaps we are replaying a story in our head that was given to us at a very young age that keeps us hostage to a version of ourselves and traps us in a narrative of shame. Perhaps you have indeed wronged someone through your words or your actions. And the story that you hear in your head might reflect the harm that you have caused and engender feelings of shame or guilt. And I want to take just a quick minute to distinguish between shame and guilt because they are very different things. One is helpful, one is not. Guilt tells us, I did a bad thing. But shame tells us, I am a bad thing. Shame is part of a spiral of self-punishment and stuckness, while guilt can be an acknowledgement of failure and is often the first step to self-forgiveness. What are the emotions that you feel towards yourself? What do you need from yourself for healing? What are the costs of continuing to punish yourself? Self-forgiveness is especially potent because you contain both the victim and the perpetrator in one entity. You are both, and therefore you are divided. And it is through the process of self-healing, this internal exchange of energies, that these two parts can be fused back into a whole life and something new created out of what came before. Now, whether you are drawn today towards forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, some combination thereof, I invite you into a meditative ritual, another kind of healing experiment. Now, I have, I have I've asked my ushers for some help, and they are going to be passing out some 
cloth in baskets. I invite you to take one as we enter into this meditative space. And let's start by taking a few deep breaths together, in through your nose and out again. You guys can go ahead and come forward with those baskets. I invite each of you to take one of these pieces of fabric. You are a vessel that represents the best possible you. But you are not able to fully express your true self because of the burdens of things that you have forgiven, that are not forgiven about yourself or in others. There's debris that accumulates along the way of living our life. We don't really notice the burden of this debris because it builds up slowly, like putting one stone on top of the other. Eventually, the collective weight bears down, but by the time we notice, we may not even remember what it's from. Take some time to think about what you need to forgive in yourself or in others. As you look at this fabric, notice, hold it up to the light, notice the way these threads are interwoven. This fabric represents the entanglements and attachments that we have to people and places and situations that we have not forgiven. In this moment, think of those resentments that we hold towards others and towards ourself that we are hanging on to. As you look at the fabric you are holding, trace the path of those individual threads. They are bound together just as we are bound to each other by our inability to forgive. They keep us, this keeps us from being fully in the world. The energy needed to maintain these entanglements to keep this story alive drains us and weighs us down even more than what we originally held. You are a potent energy source. How are you best served in using that energy to hold this weight and maintain these entanglements or to offer forgiveness and to let go of that which binds us? to our anger, to our pain, to our resentment. Of the situations and people that come to mind, I invite you to choose one, one that you are willing and ready to forgive, or at least open to exploring the idea of forgiving. With that situation or person in mind, take a few quiet breaths. As you exhale, say silently to yourself, I forgive you, I release you, I let go. When we explore the possibility of forgiveness, we allow ourselves to become more than the hurt places in ourselves. We take responsibility for the relationship we have to our own pain and begin to untangle ourselves. In the coming moment of silence, imagine releasing your pain from the bonds of resentment. When you are ready, hold the fabric on either side of the cut and rip it in half to symbolize this release. That felt very satisfying to me.
<laughs> As you leave today, I invite you to place the cloth that you have torn in half in one of the baskets in the back. We will be using them again in a couple of weeks during worship. If you'd like to keep one with you, you are more than welcome to. If you'd like to take another piece of fabric to take home with you, I invite you to do that as well. As we draw near to that quiet, essential side of ourselves, may we open enough to consider the sacred choices we make that add up to a lifetime. May we all be blessed with riches of the spirit and moment upon moment of peace. Please join me in our closing hymn, Both Sides Now, the lyrics to which are printed in your order of service. <laughs>